So yeah, you heard that right. A fission nuclear bomb essentially serves as the blasting cap for a hydrogen device. Hey everybody, Professor Davis here, ChemSurvival.com, the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And in today's talk, we're going to discuss an interesting question, one that's uh, come up a little bit, especially due to recent uh, events in the news. And that is, uh, do nuclear weapons have a shelf life? There have been uh, a lot of uh, conjectures out there about um, how well maintained certain nations' nuclear arsenals may be and whether or not when they push that big button, those weapons are actually going to function. Uh, so today we're going to discuss a little bit about this from the radiological or the radiochemical perspective. Uh, and that's partially because that's more my specialty. I'm not really a nuclear engineer, but also because it's very difficult to get uh, a really good picture of how these weapons function. A lot of these are still closely guarded national secrets, but what aren't national secrets are the radiological behavior of the materials that are commonly used in these weapons. So let's think about that. Now, the first thing you might think is, okay, well, these are radioactive substances used in these nuclear payloads, things like uranium and plutonium. And so maybe they decay over time and that causes them to be uh, less explosive or even maybe not detonate at all. But when we take a quick look at the NUDAT website over here at Brookhaven National Labs, what we find is that, for example, for U-235, the isotope of uranium that is uh, principally responsible for the fission reaction in a uh, uranium gun-type bomb, what we find is that the fissile isotope's half-life is about 700 million years. Uh, similarly, we can look at plutonium. Now, it's a little more complex with plutonium because there are multiple isotopes usually in the mixture. However, the principal fissile isotope is plutonium-239 with a half-life of about 24,000 years. And so if we put these, these numbers to the calculations, what we find is that after about 100 years, uh, a sample of enriched uranium-235 will still have 99.99% of the fissile U-235 present. And for plutonium even, we're looking at 99.02% remaining. So it's unlikely that loss of fissile isotopes due to radioactive decay is going to significantly influence the performance of a fission device. So to understand why there are still problems with putting a fissionable device on the shelf and then bringing it back down decades later, we have to consider some other design elements. Now, before we do that, let's just think in general about how fission devices work. So generally, they run on a principle called collision-induced nuclear fission, and that is that slow neutrons, neutrons with specific energies, have a strong tendency to, when they collide with a fissile nucleus, induce that fission to occur. And in doing so, that larger nucleus breaks into two, creating two smaller nucleids. Now, in this case, I've got barium and krypton, but there are many, many different um, modes of fission for, say, uranium-235, as is shown in this example. But what's really important here is not what the two-daughter nuclei are. What's really important here is that it generates excess neutrons. And those neutrons can then go on to induce additional nuclear fission within that material. And so this chain reaction happens when multiple neutrons induce fission, which release more neutrons, which induce more fission. And if the fissile nucleus is sufficiently concentrated in the sample, we have enough what we call neutron flux to propagate a rapid explosion, a rapid reaction. So this is the principle on which nuclear fission devices work. And there are really two fundamental types that are commonly discussed. I'm going to talk about those with you right now. Now, the first of those is a gun type device in which a conventional charge of explosives is used to shoot two subcritical masses of, say, uranium-235 together. And when they merge together under those conditions, they form what's called a critical mass. It's called a critical mass because with that much material, deep within the core of that material, there's enough neutron flux to initiate this runaway nuclear explosion. So when these two subcritical masses combine, they become critical. The neutron flux is high enough that we have a detonation. Now, another type of device um, would be one like a uh, Fat Man, which was also dropped at the end of World War II, and that's a plutonium-based device. These tend to be designs that involve a core of the fissile material, in this case, plutonium, let's say 239, uh, and conventional explosive is packed around that material, 
along with some type of a material that's going to reflect neutrons and bounce them back inside of that material, back towards the, the nuclear uh, fissile payload. And so when the conventional explosives are detonated, they compress this core. It becomes so dense that it becomes critical. And the neutrons are then reflected back in to further intensify the neutron flux. And we have a nuclear explosion once again. So aside from really maintaining the conventional explosives, making sure that they work, it doesn't seem like there would be much of a shelf life associated with these kind of weapons. But a modification has been made to these more recently that actually makes it pretty certain that after a period of time, you're going to have some trouble getting this nuclear weapon to function. And that is doping of these weapons with tritium. Now, commonly what's used is a tritium deuteride gas that is injected into the core at the moment of detonation. At that point, the, uh, the tritium and the deuterium, when the fission reaction initiates, begin to fuse themselves in a fusion reaction. And this fusion reaction creates a very small amount of energy by comparison. It doesn't contribute much to the yield. But what it does do is it creates a helium-4 nucleus and it releases yet another neutron, increasing the neutron flux, thereby allowing that fissile payload to undergo more fission. A typical device from the 1940s or 50s like these would only have about 1% to 10% of their actual fissile mass undergo the fission reaction. And by doping in this additional tritium, a much higher yield could be obtained. But this advancement that's supposed to create an even more devastating weapon actually has a drawback. And that is that tritium is itself radioactive, undergoing what we call a beta decomposition, losing an electron from its nucleus to form helium-3. And this process has a half-life that's only around a decade. So why is that such a problem? Well, obviously, the first problem here is that you're losing tritium. Over time, the tritium is decaying into helium-3. You're not going to get the same type of nuclear chemistry that you would when this weapon was initially assembled. But there's an even worse ramification to this, and that is that the helium-3 itself has a quenching effect on the nuclear reaction. As the helium-3 builds, helium-3 is able to absorb free neutrons to become a more stable helium-4 nucleus meaning that the tritium that was initially added to the weapon to increase its yield is becoming helium-3 and actually decreasing the yield or possibly even preventing the weapon from detonating properly at all. And that's a real issue because, of course, 12 years is not that long of a time scale. Uh, and so this 12.32-year half-life that's reported by the New Dat website allows us to predict that within about a decade, Half of the tritium has become helium-3, meaning that the net increase to neutron flux is now zero. And as we go further into time, we see that we get more and more helium-3, less and less tritium, and eventually have an actual quenching effect on that weapon. So it's important to maintaining a nuclear arsenal that there be a source of tritium so that these tritium supplies can be uh, regenerated over time to ensure that the neutron flux in these weapons is as high as possible. So does that have anything to do with hydrogen bombs, you might ask? And the answer to that is yes, because remember, hydrogen bombs are what we call a thermonuclear device. Now, a thermonuclear fusion bomb has its principal payload, usually something like lithium-6 deuteride, which will fuse to produce helium nuclei, and we get a, a nuclear reaction that's even more vigorous than fission. Um, however, what we've got to remember when it comes to these weapons is that in order to generate the temperatures and pressures necessary to initiate fusion, we have to use a fission device to create that environment. Nothing else can create the kind of pressures and temperatures that are needed to start off the fusion reaction. So yeah, you heard that right. A fission nuclear bomb essentially serves as the blasting cap for a hydrogen device. And so even hydrogen bombs, the largest and most devastating nuclear bombs in, um, in the arsenals of the United States and other nuclear powers, still relies on fission weapon technology to operate. And those fission weapons are more often than not boosted using this tritium deuteride additive, which is a real problem and needs to be constantly monitored. So in short, from a radiochemical perspective, do nukes have a shelf life? Yes, most of them do. And certainly the most powerful of the designs that, that are available will need to be maintained so that their tritium levels remain high, their helium-3 levels remain low, and neutron flux is maximized at the time that they're used. 
Now that's all for today's discussion, everyone. Thanks for watching. I'm Professor Davis from chemsurvival.com, YouTube channel Chem Survival. See you next time.